I have a confession. I made this talk before I got the case, so um, it's going to be, but it's still, I mean, the, that patient, uh, I guess, technically qualifies for disreplacement. Um, but I want to thank uh, Don Park and John Chi for letting me open the program. Uh, John was actually my senior resident when I was a neurosurgery intern during my uh, ortho residency, and Yu Jung was my uh, senior resident um, as an orthopedic resident. And so preparing for this talk kind of brought me back to memory lane. Uh, some survival tips, mouth breathe only at the general. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had to do that on the flight over all the way from Chicago. It was pretty bad. Uh, make your attendings your co-authors. It'll keep them off your back. <laughs> and uh, one universal piece of advice was never, ever argue with you, John. <laughs> Um, Yujung, is it true that at Emory your nickname was YK47? Is that how the, I, any, any case, okay. Um, we're also in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, this is a country with the most positive influence globally, which is pretty surprising. I think almost as surprising as the United States has dropped 26 percentage points between 2016 and 2017. But fortunately for Yu Jung, the province of Ontario just this year published everything she, know, she needs for her side of the debate. Uh, it's a technology assessment about uh, cervical disc arthroplasty, 223 pages of policymaking goodness that concludes that disc replacement is effective and safe, better outcomes, cost effective, good value for the money, and it's based off of level one evidence that's available in the United States because of our IDE studies for the eight uh, devices that are on the market. So maybe it is futile to debate uh, Yu Jung, and I should just give up, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, I'll start with that we're not really talking about true disc replacements. Say, unlike the hip and knee, which are diarthroidal joints, uh, the intervertebral disc is an exquisitely designed structure that allows motion and stability through the interactions of nucleus pulposus and annulus fibrosus. And as a biologic tissue, it has dynamic properties that disc replacements just cannot reproduce. So in an unconstrained device like the MOBI-C, uh, you can see that uh, through its range of motion, it's pretty much in the neutral zone and suddenly hits a hard stop. That's inflection. In axial loading, it's made out of metal and plastic, and so there's really no give at all. And so uh, Benzel wrote that TDAs are designed to mimic the youthful disc. Unfortunately, as portrayed here, they fail miserably from a mechanical perspective. And if you look at this exquisitely designed intervertebral disc, and then you kind of look at this primitive appearing disc replacement. And I think it's a little bit naive to say that um, it provides motion pers the same motion as your natural neck, and perhaps, um, worst case, it's a little bit misleading to say that. And there's a lot of biomechanical studies about this. This is one out of Colorado. Uh, they planted pressure sensors in cadaver's facet joints, and they, they brought it through a bunch of motions and variety of conditions, and they found for the disc replacement that the facet contact forces were significantly higher at the index level, actually as high as the destabilizing effect of the discectomy. And so uh, the author's theory was that this would lead to early facet arthrosis. And so uh, the motion of a disc replacement is akin to driving on square tires. Like, <laughs> it'll move, but if you're on it for a long time, your neck's probably going to start hurting. And let's not forget that ACDF is a very forgiving operation. Uh, the distraction, the stability uh, provides relief from radicular pain, and the fusion provides the longevity. Um, and then Dr. Ahn showed in this classic study that you don't even have to directly decompress the uncomfortable joint. Now, this is kind of an older study. It's retrospective. It uses Odom criteria. But the high fusion rate and the 85% good excellent results, I think that's the way we still think about ACDF. Dish replacement might not be as um, forgiving. I want to thank uh, Tom Chaw for providing this picture here. <laughs> and this is a very honest paper out of uh, Korea, actually, where it's a small series of MOBI-C patients. A considerable portion had malposition using the author's criteria. And there's a remarkably higher rate of adjacent segment degeneration when there is a malposition device, at least in the AP plane. Not to mention, we're dealing with new technologies and new unimaginable complications. Uh, granulomatous reactions, hypermobility, and I think this is really concerning is where. So this is a retrieval study of 30 pro discs, and they found deformation of the poly, third body wear, and get this, 80% had burnishing and metal loss. And this is with a maximum implant time of three and a half years. And these things are supposed to last 40 or 50 years. But back to the script. So proponents of cervical disc arthroplasty will tell you about motion preservation, which we know is not physiologic. 
But perhaps the more important things are the better patient reported outcomes, lower rates of adjacent segment disease, and lower rates of reoperation. And these claims are based off the highest level of evidence in clinical medicine. The prospective multi-center randomized controlled trial using sound methodologies and conducted with the oversight of the U.S. government. <laughs> but they're all non-inferiority trials. What this means is that they were designed to show that disc replacement was no worse than 10% worse than fusion. So why would you use that study design? Well, first of all, the threshold for success is a lot lower, but it allows you to put more patients than disc arthroplasty group, conduct smaller trials, use as tree analysis. There are a lot of other benefits of doing this. Now, all of the trials were non-inferiority in design, but all of them reported superiority. And using a non-inferiority study design to claim superiority is like putting the shoe on the wrong foot. It's not going to be valid. And this is actually um, a pretty good paper, very tedious to go through, but uh, what they evaluated was superiority claims in all the randomized controlled trials in the spine literature. And most of the RCTs, not surprisingly, are in disc arthroplasty, which unfortunately also showed the highest rates of bias. And so the authors pick apart each study one by one. The first one, um, the sense of analysis did not show superiority, but the authors claimed it anyway. In the second one, the FDA told the authors, take out the superiority claim because your analysis wasn't clear. In the third one, almost a fifth of patients did not undergo their randomized treatment, but they did an as treat analysis anyway. The fourth one is probably the most egregious. They basically changed the outcome measure so to show superiority. And the, the list goes on and on. All of these studies use a superiority threshold of 0%. Most of them define superiority after the study was completed. And many of them do not use confidence intervals, which would at least give the reader some idea of the treatment effect. So uh, even though spine surgeons are not statisticians, I think that um, proponents of disc arthroplasty might be less than forthcoming when they make these claims of superiority using a non-inferiority design. But statistics aside, the patients who are in these studies are different, right? They want a disc replacement. The only way they're gonna get it is to enroll in this trial. Most of the trials were blind until post-op, but the Brian one was not. And if you look at the patients who were randomized to fusion, more than double the proportion of patients dropped out. And so the concern is that if you have a patient with a strong preference for one treatment and they receive another treatment, they undergo something called resentful demoralization. It's a technical term. And so the concern is that maybe the difference in outcome isn't based off the of physiology, but rather psychology. And this is something that reminded me when I was in the Army. I, did, uh, I was at a hospital where they, we looked at the um, follow-ups after the PCM ID. We were one of the study sites. And patients come to me, they're like, I feel great. I'm so glad I got the disc replacement. Boy, those fusion patients, they're out, they're out of luck. And they would show up with x-rays that look like this. And I never really had the heart to tell them that they basically have a fusion. But figuring out like, how much these preference, patient preferences matter is very difficult, actually. There are some proponents who think that the randomized controlled trial study design with two arms isn't good enough, that we should use something called a fully randomized preference trial. This has four arms. Patients get to choose their treatment, and those who are indifferent, um, then they get randomized. This is a meta-analysis of eight studies. Most of the patients had a preference. And perhaps not surprisingly, if you received your preference, you had a superior outcome versus those who were indifferent and those who did not get their treatment, although it's not statistically significant in the latter one. But this is physical therapy, these studies. Now, if you apply this to patients getting disc replacements, I think that the confounding effect could be even greater. Investigator preferences matter too, and this because adjacent segment disease, symptomatic pseudoarthrosis, the need for reoperation, all of this relies on the judgment of the surgeon. And if you want to see a problem, there's a good chance that you're gonna find a problem. Here's a typical meta-analysis, randomized controlled trials. Most of them are IDEs. The fusion group had double the rate of reoperation as disc replacement. And it is, I thought it was kind of weird. Like, okay, we have this operation, ACDF. We considered a home run surgery. And then suddenly it becomes a crappy surgery because we have this new alternative. And so the, the surgeons at Rush also wondered the same thing. So they looked at their cervical fusion patients who were not in an IDE, but would have met criteria for being in the IDE. And when they looked at these patients, they had much lower rates of reoperation, actually very similar to the cervical disc replacement arm 
of these IDEs. And so the elephant in the room is conflict of interest. You know, when I was younger, I thought that clinical research was all about the truth and, per, and advancing the field. But when you look at these cervical disc replacements and these IDEs, there are multiple parties involved with multiple interests. And when investigators become investors or otherwise have a financial interest in the outcome, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that the results are going to be skewed. But just how skewed is pretty striking. This is a, out of neurosurgery, looked at 110 RCTs published in three neurosurgery journals. The odds ratio was 23, that there was going to be a positive outcome with industry sponsorship versus non-industry sponsorship. So in conclusion, disc replacement does not provide physiologic motion, does not have long-term outcomes, does not provide the benefits of fusion like indirect compression or stability. The superiority claims are based off of statistically suspect methods. And finally, the data itself is subject to confounding by the biases by the patients and surgeons. Thanks.